Welcome back to Homestead Dreamers. I'm Elena, and today I'm gonna to be planting some onion seeds. I like to pick one plant every single year to focus on growing really well in my garden, and this year I'm picking onions. In the past, I haven't been very successful with growing them, and I think there are multiple factors that played into that, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but I find that this is extremely helpful for when you are trying to grow a plant really well that you've struggled to grow in the past. If you're new to growing onions, there's multiple ways that you can grow them. You can start them from seed. You can purchase what are called onion sets, which basically look like mini little onions that you plant in the ground, or you can buy transplants. The transplants look like little onion stalks and you can buy those online or locally to you. In the past, I've always planted the onion sets and I have not been very successful with them. Last year, I dove into this topic more and I did some research and learned that onion sets are not the greatest option for planting onions and that's because onions are biennials. What that means is that the first year they like to produce a bulb and then the second year is when they go to flower. So when you are planting those onion sets, you're essentially planting a second year plant and it wants to go to flower and put its energy into that rather than making a big bulb. Another thing I learned in my research is that the variety that you choose to plant in your area is very important. So there are long day varieties, short day varieties, and intermediate day varieties. This is based on the latitude of where you are located. I'll throw a link below to a map so you can kind of figure out where you're located and what variety you should be planting. We are in a long day region. We are located in Pennsylvania. So the variety that I am planting is called a Dakota onion. They are specifically meant for long day and I wanted an onion that is good for storage. This variety is specifically known for being good for storage. So this is what I'm going to be planting in our garden. I am just doing one variety this year because I need to focus on growing it really well. I could have tried multiple varieties and then maybe kind of experimented but I figured one variety is a good start. I'll be sowing my seeds in these three inch pots. Typically when I'm starting seeds indoors I'm starting them in a six cell container similar to this and then I pot them up into something larger like this. This works really well for my other cool crops like brassicas and lettuce. I like to start them in something small and then pot them up. But in this case, I'm gonna start them in this container so that I don't have to disturb the roots or anything. And I can just plant them here and keep them in these containers until they're ready to go outside. There are a lot of different mixtures that you can use to actually plant your seeds in. I like to experiment every year as I learn learn more about the different types of mediums available. So uh, about two years ago, I started learning about peat moss and how it's harvested and that it's extremely destructive for the environment. So since then, I've been experimenting with alternate ways to use less peat moss. I haven't gotten away from it completely, but one of the things that I learned about last year was a product called pit moss. This is actually made out of a recycled paper product and this holds an insane amount of moisture. So it's really challenging to just plant in it directly because you'll end up with mold or root rot. So I have been taking this pit moss and mixing it with peat moss. This specific seed starter mix is just something that I found, I think either at Walmart or Home Depot local to me. You can also buy it online, I believe. There's nothing special about it. It's just an organic seed starting mix. That is something that I experimented with last year. I mixed these two together and it worked pretty well. Another thing that I started last year as an experiment is I started making what's called leaf mold, which is essentially just a bunch of leaves decomposing by themselves. As I was doing research into the medium, available for seed starting, I realized that most of them do not contain nutrition. So I figured I might as well just put some leaves in a bucket, pour some water in there and crush them up and continue to mix them throughout the year and let them break down and see what I get. So I now, after a year, have like this nice brown organic material that I made at home. I'm planning to mix this in with these other two things this year and experiment with this. One thing to note about the leaf mold is that it does have some bigger chunks in it. Typically with seed starting soil, you want it to be finer so that you can make sure that the seed is getting contact with the soil so that it germinates properly. I honestly don't think it's too big of a deal as long as you have enough of that light material on top near where the seed is. 
We'll see, I'm gonna be experimenting, but I think this is gonna work out pretty well. In general, each year as I continue growing in our garden, I'm always looking for ways to improve and to learn more about how I can do things a little bit more sustainably. I love the idea of eventually being able to produce our own seed starting soil at home, or at least a good portion of it. So I'm really hoping that the leaf mold works out because if I can just gather up leaves and put them in a huge trash can and continue to water them and make sure that they are breaking down over a year's period of time, then I could have a really good seed starting medium to maybe mix with a couple other things and then use in my pot. It's really easy to continue doing things the way that you've always done it or the way that you initially did it and that works for you, but I'm a big fan of experimenting and trying new things and seeing if there are different ways to do stuff. I'm a very open-minded person, so if I see an idea online, I'm like, hey, that looks awesome. Awesome. let me try that but I know not everyone thinks that way but I think it is a good practice to get in especially when you're gardening because there are just so many different ways to do things and what works for me may not work for you it all just depends on your resources what you have available to you your tools and just your climate and your region too but overall I think experimentation is good so I showed you the containers that I'll be using for this like I said I'm gonna be using three inch pots I have two different colors here so I'm thinking what I'm gonna do is mix two different types of mixes together. So I'm gonna do some with just the pit moss and the peat, and then I'm gonna do some with pit moss, peat, and the leaf mold. I really don't think I'm gonna be filling all of these containers. There's a lot here, so I think that I'll probably only use about half of these. These containers are from Bootstrap Farmer. I absolutely love their equipment. If you have the chance to get some higher quality equipment, I highly recommend them. Everything is made of a really, really thick plastic and it's durable and it lasts. Also, the other really cool thing about these three inch pots is they have this black little tray thing that each pot fits in perfectly. And then this sits in your 1020 tray, which is really nice because in the past when I've had large pots like this in a 1020 tray and I move things around, they would wanna fall over. It's nice that they have this little mold that that these pots can then just sit in really nicely. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm gonna do is mix up my dry ingredients. Then I like to use hot boiling water to moisten the soil. Why I use hot boiling water is because if in the case that there were fungus gnats that laid eggs in our soil, hopefully it would kill them. This isn't as critical if you're buying new soil, but both of the soil bags that I have had been sitting in an outdoor building for the duration of the winter. So there's a good chance that in the fall, something may have laid an egg in there. So I'm gonna be using some hot boiling water get that moist let it cool down a little bit and then put them in my pots and put some seeds in You can see that the pit moss mixed with the peat moss has a very light and airy texture to it. There's not a lot of big clumps in this, which is kind of what you typically see with a seed starting soil. I mixed about two part peats to one part pit moss. Using my fancy, very sophisticated stirring spoon here. <laughs> Just kidding. Just a branch. The moisture level that we're looking for with our seed starting mix is similar to a wrung out sponge. I just like to pick up a handful and squeeze it out and see what it looks like. This is pretty much perfect. It may have a little bit of excess water, but it's not overly saturated, so it should be okay. Now for the fun part, putting the soil in the containers. I prefer not to use gloves when it comes to playing in the dirt. I know some people like gloves, but I think it's more fun to just like feel the dirt and play in it. Even when I'm in my regular garden with all the bugs and stuff. Oh man, I'm, I'm pretty much, I wouldn't say I'm never wearing gloves, but if I'm doing a task that is just involving like digging in the dirt, I usually am not wearing gloves. But if I'm dealing with a plant that irritates my skin, then I will wear gloves. The plants that tend to irritate my skin are pretty much just squash and tomatoes. The tomatoes, I don't know if, I wouldn't say they irritate them, but there's like this green goo that gets all over my body whenever I'm touching tomato plants. So I prefer to wear gloves when I'm dealing with those. Yeah. 
As I was putting the soil in the pots, I realized I probably could have mixed a little bit more of the pit moss in the soil mixture. I didn't take any notes last year and I didn't write down the ratio that I used. I'm guessing I probably used closer to a half and half ratio of it, but I'm definitely gonna take note of that so that when I start my other seeds, I know that for this year. Here's a close up look of what these seeds look like. They're pretty dark, so once I get them in the soil, it's gonna be a little bit challenging to see them, but I'm planning on overseeding and doing about 10 to 15 seeds per cell. This doesn't have to be exact, but I'm going to kind of evenly space them throughout each one of these containers. I looked in my seed packet. I don't even know if I have enough to fill these other containers. That's totally okay. We'll see how far we get with these. I'm probably not gonna be able to talk while I'm counting, so give me a minute. <laughs> I have 10 to 15 seeds in each one of these cells. I wasn't able to fit any in this one, so I'm gonna remove that for now so I can empty that out. Now I am just putting a light layer of soil over top of the seeds. I'm just trying to put enough here to cover them and make sure that they have contact with the soil. You always wanna be careful about planting things a little bit too deep because if you do, you may have something that germinates but just can't reach the top of the soil. So I'm just putting a light covering over top. If I have a bigger seed, I'll use a pencil and I'll push down each individual seed. In this case, I think I can just get away with putting a layer of soil. I'm not sure if you can tell from the video, but the top soil is a little bit dry. Regardless of if it was dry or not, I would still water these after I was done putting them in the containers. I'm just gonna use a little bit of a spray bottle here to moisten that soil. This is how I will water them over the next few days until they germinate. I will kind of just continue spraying them. If they look like they need more water than a spritzing, I'll put water in this 1020 tray and let it soak up from the bottom. You don't want to oversaturate the soil. It's not as big of a deal whenever there's not roots in there, but you do want to keep it moist enough so that things germinate and stay alive as soon as they germinate. Now that my seeds are planted, the waiting game begins. I wish I could put these in a nice seed starting setup, but unfortunately with the state of our self-built home, I do not have that. So for the time being, I'm going to add a humidity dome and I'm gonna place this in the shower of our RV. The reason why I cannot put these plants inside our house is because the temperature is way too cold. So right now we are keeping the garage at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit using the radiant heat flooring system that we installed. Unfortunately, that's not really ideal for seeds to germinate. Since these are cool weather crops, they may actually germinate at that temperature, but I would rather keep them in a slightly warmer temperature to give them a better chance of germination. So that's why they will be in the RV. I would like to give you all a tour of the house in the current state before we get drywall. Drywall is currently planned for the first week of February, so I think it would be fun to show you what everything looks like in the current state. We have been working on this house build for almost two years now. We have done about 80% of the work ourselves and it's taken up a large portion of our time. So it would be fun to be able to show you all of the inside details before we even have drywall so you can kind of get an idea of all of the work that went into it. Real quick, I'll show you the radiant floor heat setup and how we measure the temperature inside our garage. All of this piping here is a part of the radiant floor heat system. Before we poured the concrete slab, we put in loops of potable PEX piping and it all connects here at this manifold. We are able to control the temperature of the slab using this thermostat right here. So I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It's kind of dark. Okay, now you can see it. So this is the set temperature. So currently we are set at 49 degrees. This is the ambient measurement of what the outside temperature is. And then this is what is determining if the water heater needs to turn on or not. So if this temperature was at 48, it would be running until it hit 49. 
In addition to that thermostat, I also have this external monitor that measures percent humidity and temperature. This is just nice to have in the case that we are growing anything in here. So we've tried growing mushrooms in the past. I'll have more on that soon. And we also are growing fodder. So having these measurements easily available is really important so that we can figure out why things may be not growing or why they're growing slowly, all of those things. I mentioned in a previous video that we are building a garage with an apartment on top. The garage is going to be heated by the radiant heat flooring and then we also have two wall units, but we will have a full blown HVAC system for the apartment and that's what we're currently working on. So stay tuned for the tour that will be coming soon and thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Check this out. I already have awesome humidity within this dome. It's only been about 20 minutes and you can see all that buildup inside. I'm able to control the amount of humidity by moving this little vent so I can open and close it as much as I want to. And there are two of those. So if I need to let some air in, I can go ahead and do that.